Good evening. I'm Sally Yurkovich, Director of Educational Exchange and Special Projects at the American Scandinavian Foundation. I'm pleased to be able to welcome you all here tonight, and um, I, I oversee our fellowships and grants programs. So it's always a very special occasion when I can introduce a program featuring one of our fellows. Ryan Skinner is an ethnomusicologist or musical anthropologist who studies the expressive cultures and social worlds of contemporary Africa and its European diaspora. He's conducted extensive field work in Mali and Sweden. ASF is pleased to have supported the research in Sweden that contributed to his recently published book that we'll hear more about tonight, Afro-Sweden, Becoming Black in a Colorblind Country. Ryan is currently an associate professor of musicology at The Ohio State University in Columbus. He's working on a third book project, a biographical study of a Burkina Faso filmmaker. And in addition to his scholarly work, Ryan is the author and illustrator of a children's book on the Kora, a 21-stringed West African harp, and he's an accomplished Kora player. Tonight, um, talking with Ryan is Krisa Pugh, um, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the New School. Her work examines the social legacies of imperialism in post-colonial Africa and Southeast Asia, as well as cultural heritage, museums, and violence. We're pleased to welcome both Ryan and, and Krisa to discuss a topic that relates to other programs that we've done on race and belonging in the Nordic countries. I'm just going to say a few words about the, the book itself. Um, but before I do that, I just want to thank um, the American Scandinavian Foundation so much for, for making this work possible. Um, uh, it is true that I received uh, a fellowship in the initial stages of this research, and that, that made all the difference to uh, take me to a place uh, to, to conduct this work and to begin to, to develop these ideas, which have been developing now for about a decade. So this is a long time coming, and I'm glad to be here. So a few words about the book. Afro-Sweden, Becoming Black in a Colorblind Country, is about Afro-Swedes, about people of African descent in Sweden, it is about their stories and their strivings, their art and their politics, their language and their social life, and their vision for a Sweden that makes space for their presence, past, present, and future. I am an ethnographer by training, which means that I tell stories about the human condition, about community, culture, and society, what these social formations mean in different places to different people and at different times, and why they matter. My book is a collection of such stories about the social history and public culture of Sweden's black and African diaspora. The book is organized into six chapters, divided into two parts, which present the two central themes of the study, remembering and renaissance. Remembering is a concept rooted in social history. The three chapters in part one emerge from oral history, targeted archival inquiries, and open-ended dialogue about the Afro-Swedish past, both recent and deep. As a concept, remembering describes recollecting the past as a socially constitutive practice. In other words, remembering invokes a common history to foster a sense of community. Remembering is a deeply human practice, signaling the way we anchor and situate ourselves in relationship to each other in time. But for migrant, exiled, or otherwise dispersed populations, that is, for diasporas, there is a particular urgency to the ingathering of history to reconstitute the social. By way of comparison, some examples from outside of the African diaspora in Sweden. One of them is Ro Johanna Rubin Dranger's recently published graphic novel, Ihog Komos Tiliv, Remember Us to Life which beautifully narrates and illustrates her Jewish family's fragmented and fraught history across generations in Sweden, Scandinavia, and Europe. Another example of another recent vintage is Mats Jönsson's Nar vi var Samer, When We Were Sami, which is also a graphic novel in which the author tells of his efforts to reconnect with an indigenous Sami heritage disrupted, dispersed, and nearly destroyed by Swedish colonialism. A good example of Afro-Swedish remembering comes from a book which came out earlier this year, 
2022, while my own book was in press, so it doesn't appear in uh, Afro-Sweden. Amit Levine's Svart Historia, Black History, a book that episodically charts significant moments in African and Afro-diasporic history in Swedish for a Swedish readership. The book is intended to fill gaps in the historical record which, in Sweden as elsewhere, often elides or obscures Africa and its diaspora. For Levine, an Afro-Swedish journalist, to remember black history is to re-member, re-member diasporic community. Renaissance, in my book, refers to generative moments of creative vitality and social possibility. It describes periods of cultural genesis and reimagination, when communities become critically and self-consciously aware of themselves. While the term may signal for some Europe and its modern history, for example, the ideas and expressions of the Dutch or Italian Renaissance, my points of reference are drawn from the Black and African world, from places like Harlem, Chicago, Paris, Dakar, Lagos, and Johannesburg. Sites where the African diaspora has coalesced as a transnational community through novel social and cultural movements and expressions, and through histories that challenge us to think about Renaissance in broader comparative terms. In my book, I make the case for a specifically Afro-Swedish Renaissance in the present, focusing on innovative practices in language, politics, and the performing visual and literary arts. To exemplify, exemplify the art of Afro-Swedish Renaissance, I invite us to consider the music and visual culture of Sinabusi. Born to a Gambian father and a Swedish mother, raised in the southern Swedish town of Halmstad and the sprawling Gambian capital of Banjul, Sinabusi is an internationally acclaimed singer and songwriter performing in the popular Afro-diasporic idioms of soul and R&B. Describing C's music in chapter 6, I write, and it's always a strange pleasure to quote oneself, critics rave about her distinctive soul pop style, a mix of the singer's studious attention to the vocal currents of the Black Atlantic and the remarkable pop alchemy perfected by Swedish musicophiles like Magnus Lidehel, who produced and co-wrote the tracks on C's first LP. More subtly, one might hear the influences of her late father, Maudusi, a Gambian band leader who performed an eclectic mix of mbalach, reggae, and West African funk until his untimely death in 2013. For the younger C, this diverse sonic pastiche achieves a distinctive and generative consonance, both musical and social. That is, her hybrid, genre-defying soul pop resonates to, to the tune of her multiply conscious personhood as a Gambian, a Swede, an artist, and a woman. So I would like for us to watch her video, Breathe, uh, which is uh, of a recent vintage. I'm going to say it's of 2021, that's a guess, uh, but it's very recent. This is her video, Breathe. This video is from 2018. <laughs> I looked it up on my phone afterwards. I should have had that date down there. Um, I just want to repeat some of the, the lyrics before we get our conversation started, uh, Krisa, because I think they're so moving and powerful. Uh, and I just want to draw attention to the words here and home and the kinds of words that she's attaching to here and home. I love it here because I don't have to explain to them why I'm beautiful, because I am beautiful. Back home, they're scared. They're so scared of me that I become scared of me. I become scared of me. The way you smile when you believe your future is different, is different. Forward ever, backward never. I just think it's gorgeous. <laughs> that was yeah. really beautiful. Do you know where it was filmed? Um, many of her many of her videos um, are set in one of two places: um, Senegambia, Banjul specifically. That didn't look like it was in the city, um, but I, I'm guessing in the Gambia. And then many of her videos are set are set in in Sweden, either in the city or in the or in the forest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. No, it's really beautiful, and I love the the evocation of Kwame and Kruma. Right. Uh, on the banner as well, just kind of speaking to this idea of uh, kind of pan-Africanism that exactly. you, you speak to in the book exactly. as well. And it also, just the visual imagery, I mean, speak a lot about nature as well. 
um, especially in the third chapter. So, you know, we'll get to that. We'll get there. We'll get there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Great. Um, So it's such an honor uh, to be here with you this evening. Um, I just finished the book actually yesterday, and so it's very fresh um, for me. But I just want to congratulate you on such a beautiful, um, you know, artistic, um, just profound um, book that I um, hope many, if not all of you, um, will be able to read. Um, So I just want to, you know, kind of start our conversation by asking you um, what brought you um, you know, to this project, um, a project about um, Afro-Sweden um, and, you know, what were some of the motivations for the project? Like we heard, obviously, that you, um, you received some generous funding, um, but, you know, in terms of the kind of, you know, um, personal or professional or intellectual motivations for the project, I'd be curious to know um, what was really kind of the genesis of, of this book. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there are lots of there are lots of lots of streams. There are several streams that that build the river of, of this project. Um, so I'll, I'll trace a few of them. Uh, and it goes back about 21 years uh, to a time when I, I moved to Sweden uh, with my wife, and we got jobs as middle school teachers um, in a northern st- suburb of Stockholm. And uh, that school was presented to me when I applied for that job as an immigrant school. So it was predominantly non-white kids, um, mostly from the Middle East and and the Horn of Africa, uh, originally, um, in terms of their parental heritage. Uh, But they, for the most part, uh, the student population had grown up in Sweden. They were Swedish kids. Um, That school had a music program that you could apply to that was predominantly white and middle class. Uh, And then we were teachers within the regular public school, which was predominantly non-white. Um, and, and working class. Uh, and it was at that time, coming out of college, uh, that I, I encountered segregation and institutional racism in Sweden, and uh, without having kind of an analytic language to grapple with that, um, I observed it. Um, a fellow colleague mentioned that a, one of our students was placed in remedial, remedial Swedish despite being you know, native to Sweden, growing up in Sweden. Um, because of her background, she, I was told that you know she didn't get her language through her mother's milk, um, and at the same time that I'm encountering these sentiments in the workplace, I had also lived in West Africa for a year, and so I encountered in Sweden West African communities and became actively involved in their cultural life as a musician, primarily as a chora player, a 21-stringed harp. So working with Gambian, um, Malian, Guinean, and Senegalese communities. Um, which was rich and, and, and beautiful, it also taught me about how multiculturalism works in Sweden, which is to say you uh, get cordoned off into ethnic and national groups. Uh, and so my work with these communities was defined by nation and ethnicity. Um, but in those groups, I, I, I discovered kind of a nation Africanist um, uh, uh, community, uh, African community, uh, including, you know, a, a, in some sense, a sense of Pan-Africanism without really the language of that. Um, and I'm going to cut this story a bit short. The, 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 t- the turn is I decided to go to graduate school and write a dissertation about this, and my advisor said, no, <laughs> if you want to get a job in ethnomusicology, you have to go back to Africa. Uh, and he said, wait. Wait on this project. And his criticism was, was less of the pro- it was not of the project. It was of the discipline of ethnomusicology that wasn't really ready at that time for these kinds of uh, critical inquiries into um, uh, race, migration, diaspora, uh, in places that are understood to be proximate to the West, that is Sweden, right, in the West itself. Um, You had to go to someplace more exotic, uh, and that was going back to Mali in my case. So fast forward 12 years, I find myself back in Sweden, uh, among many of the same people that I had worked with previously, uh, asking questions, and I encounter a kind of generational shift, um, a new set of people doing different kinds of things, organizing events, uh, lectures, roundtables, uh, making art of all kinds, and using a language that didn't exist, at least to my ears, that I hadn't encountered uh, some 10, 12 years uh, prior. Uh, they were calling themselves Afro-Swedes and African-Swedes, uh, black and svart, and that's the genesis of the book. The book is sort of coming back to Sweden and encountering something uh, similar but new um, and with a different set of voices asking different kinds of questions about their existence in Sweden. Yeah. Great. So I want to kind of tease out this thread of music that you've mentioned. Um, So you're a musician Mm. yourself. You are 
um, an ethnomusicologist and a musicologist. Um, and, you know, obviously, just from the video that we've just watched, you know, music and the arts more generally um, are, are very important and kind of um, central to the story that you're telling. And so I'm wondering, um, yeah, just that, like, what is, what is the kind of role of music and the arts? Um, what kind of place does it hold within the book for you? So when I came back, so my implicit bias is always towards the arts. <laughs> I, I, I'm attracted to them. I, I, am, I am a musician. Uh, I grew up in the musical theater in Minneapolis. Um, I, uh, I, my first book is actually is a children's book that was noted <laughs> that I illustrated. Um, so I've, I've, I've long dabbled in multiple forms of artistic expression. That's part of who I am. Uh, and I, when I came back to Sweden asking questions about Africanness in Sweden initially in, in those terms, um, and when I discovered people actually asking a much broader set of more interesting questions, <laughs> Uh, they were doing so across a, a range of public expressive cultural forms. I saw theater, I saw dance, I saw visual art, I heard a lot of music. Oftentimes, the people I encountered were doing multiple things. <laughs> so Sinabusi is a musician. Uh, she's a diva, she's a, she's a vocalist, uh, and brilliant uh, as such. Um, but her politics is actually most clear, most, most present in, her, in the visual culture that she deploys in her videos, um, which, are, which, which amplify representation. You see predominantly black women in her videos. Uh, you see them occupying spaces in Sweden in, 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 uh, in other videos um, that, that we tend not to see black people and black women specifically occupying, like uh, a summer cabin like taking a, a, a walk in the forest. She puts, or, or a, a, a luxurious uh, Vonning, you know, apartment, fancy apartment in downtown Stockholm. She puts people of color, black women specifically, in places where they otherwise don't belong in the representation of personhood in Sweden generally. So, and she wants us to ask questions why, when we see that. Um, her lyrics, you know, are about everyday life. They're very humanist, they, they, they touch all of us. But her visual culture really is a, a much more specific critique. And so in the book, I write about a moment in, the, in 2016 during the Swedish Grammys, a very poignant moment when she brings out 130 um, uh, black women, Afro-Swedish women on stage, and they stand dressed in black, stoic on stage, and just look at the camera. Uh, and this is on Swedish television uh, to a national audience. And it was a profound statement about, about um, uh, black women and, and their lives and why they, why they matter. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question for you about your, your methodology, sure. um, both in researching um, and in writing the book. So, um, you know, the book is, is deeply ethnographic in the sense that you were um, having these really kind of, you know, intimate, um, you know, really kind of deep encounters um, with the folks, your, you know, your interlocutors. Um, you're in people's homes, you're going on walks with them where they're remembering some very personal, um, you know, events in their lives and their personal lives. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, you've given us a little bit of personal background, you know, that situates you um, in Sweden, but I'm wondering, you know, how did you get access to these spaces? You know, how did you get access to these individuals? Um, you know, how is it that you actually did this work, and you know, even more specifically, how did you do this work, kind of in the body that you're in, you yeah. know, as a, um, you know, as a self-identified, um, you know, kind of white American researcher? Um, you have this this quote in the book um, that says, um, "When I travel to Sweden and introduce myself as a Minnesotan in Swedish, and I might add, with my pale complexion and blonde hair, I'm often welcomed home." So I'm wondering how this idea of you being welcomed home, um, you know, not purely on the basis of, but, you know, in, in, in some ways um, because, you know, of your presentation and the fact that you speak, you know, Swedish, um, how did that also inform the way that you do the research for this book? Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting and, and still kind of a weighty moment for me, um, the, the, writing those words. Other moments stand out for me, too. Um, one is when I was on a walk with, with a friend and we're, we're sort of tracing the footsteps of his childhood in, in the Swedish um, suburb, uh, Stockholm suburb of uh, Blackaberry. And uh, I'm kind of in awe as an American 
of the forested urban planning, of just how rich and green, and this is September, so it's still pretty green, um, this urban space is and how, how you know, the ready access to that space. There's an overpass there and you walk under, uh, under, the, under the bridge uh, and it's a pedestrian walkway so that you have, you know, you're moving from green space to green space and just so thoughtfully done. And he says, wait a second, that's actually where the, the skinheads were. We didn't go here, me and my friends. We avoided these spaces. And that, that was a, a moment where I became very acutely aware of my positionality and my person, my body, as you said. Um, and, and the vision that that, 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 um, um, that positionality produces or encumbers or, you know, um, what I was blind to <laughs> as well as what I could see. Um, when I'm told, you know, welcome home or Ryan, you're basically Swedish, which I hear a lot. <laughs> um, I speak Swedish with my kids. Um, I've spent, I spent a good portion of my life speaking Swedish at this point. Um, and it is very much a part of who I am. And conducting this research and getting to know this community uh, was also a constant reminder of the privilege of that assumption or that ability to kind of blend in. Because for a lot of the folks I worked with uh, growing up in, in Sweden, uh, generationally, we, we might be talking not just about a child of an immigrant, but a grandchild um, considered to be out of place. But where do you really come from is the question they receive. And... Um, that, 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 there's a, that is, that is a, a deeply personal inflection of this book and something that I've had to keep in mind. Um, and, and writing it in there is, is, is one way of, of making sure that it, it is top of mind. Um, but you're talking about methodology and um, to get to those places where you can have those kinds of conversation requires a certain amount of trust. Um, one thing that I will say right off the bat when I started coming to Sweden with this project in mind in 2013 was I encountered a rich public cultural life. So one thing I'll, I'll, I'll sing the praises of in terms of Swedish society is its civil society. The organizational, associational life is so rich and robust. And um, I, I, I encountered, I went to lectures, and I went to performances, and I went to round tables, and um, I, I got to know people through those encounters because I didn't really know these folks. Um, they constituted a younger generation of people um, that were, you know, of the age of my middle school students when I had lived in Sweden pri previously. Um, and so coming back and seeing them kind of take center stage and make, make claims through the mechanisms of civil society. And then beginning to reach out and say, hey, I, I, I would lo love to talk to you. And then how those, how those conversations deepen is you get to know someone better. Or it becomes possible to take a walk through their hometown, for example. That, that took years. It took years of, of, of slow conversation um, with people. Um, and then, and as the book began to kind of develop out of, out of those organic forms of, of encounter and, and conversation, to share the material with them, uh, with, the, with the people who appear uh, in, in the book, and, and create a very a, a strong ethic of dialogic collaboration, um, so that the text, which is so firmly grounded in their words, uh, is true to those words. So that kind of gets to this question of how did you, um, you know, what were the kind of inflection points and, you know, moments of decision making that you took in structuring the book? Um, you know, you specifically kind of, the book is framed around these two ideas of remembering, like remembering, mm. um, and renaissance. And so I'm curious how you arrived at those two concepts as of, as a way of structuring the material that you're encountering in the world within the book. Yeah, um, so remembering was a concept um, uh, that, came, that comes from a, a graduate student of mine who, who, who wrote a project that dealt with um, uh, Japanese diasporas in Seattle. Um, and, uh, and she was working uh, with, uh, with Edward Casey, a phenomenologist, um, uh, who wrote a book about, about remembering. Um, and so I had that term kind of in dialogue through, 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 through that work and had been presenting other work that might complement that, that, um, that, uh, that line of thinking um, that she was developing. And it, for me as an Africanist, Ngugi Wationgo was a, was a strong reference point there. And he talks about remembering in ways um, that, that strongly re resonate with the themes of this book. Um, he, he, he gives us that hyphenated remembering for the, for the one part to really emphasize the the, uh, the idea of community formation, recollecting the past to constitute, reconstitute community. 
but also talks about the, what, what, what remembering is responsive to, uh, which is a dismembering, right? And the dismembering experience of the transatlantic slave trade, the dismembering experience of colonialism. Uh, and so that was a really potent word in, the Afri in an Africanist tradition that I wanted to foreground. I wanted, the, I wanted it to hit hard. I, I wanted that, that word to signify something specific to the condition of a black and African life in the world today. And that's so, uh, Wationgo is, 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 a, is perhaps the strongest sort of theoretical reference point there. Um, uh, Toni Morrison as well, I think, um, uh, looms large for, as someone who helped me understand why that matters uh, in that context. Now, Renaissance, let me back up and say this. The two words, the two phrases that preceded remembering in Renaissance were far less interesting, but, but were useful as kind of handholds for me as I was writing. They were public, cult, uh, they were social history and public culture. And by that I mean, what I meant there simply was the history was social. The history was dialogic. The history was, was the ways in which we reconstitute our past in, in dialogue with each other. Uh, and that was the substance of the, of the ethnography in that case. So that, that was my handhold before I came, became, before my consciousness sort of landed on, on remembering as a keyword. And Renaissance, it, this is about a, a multitude of art forms, um, including language and politics and the things that we call art, like theater and music and dance, et cetera. Um, so public culture was a catch-all word for that, for, for the ways in which um, expression was being used to make claims and define, really define an identity that, that didn't have a name yet. <laughs> um, and then, you know, there too, I wanted a word that would really land and, um, and land in a specific way in the, in the African diaspora because the, the use of these words for me is to help tell a, t a tale, a story about the African and black diaspora in Sweden that is more broadly applicable to the global African diaspora. Uh, and for me, Renaissance is a, is a powerful term. It's problematic perhaps in some, in some ways um, when it's uh, perhaps politicized. Um, uh, but it, it, is, it, has, it, has a, it has a kind of, it has a lineage we think of the Harlem Renaissance. We also think of a, a South African African Renaissance mm -hmm. um, that points us in certain kinds of direct points our thought in certain directions. And so, what, it, what does it mean to say in Sweden too? Right, we find this kind of uh, creative social movement that we can call Renaissance. I think that helps us take seriously um, blackness in a place that's not supposed to be black. Yeah, and we also have Beyonce's new album as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, it's a thing. You couldn't have like picked a, a better year to It's a total thing. Book. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I love this idea of public culture and I'm glad that, you know, even though it didn't, you know, kind of structure the book in the way that Renaissance does, um, it's still there. I mean, you still have this section on public culture. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who, you know, I, I research culture, um, you know, I, I research museums and artifacts and um, monuments, so, you know, forms of public culture. I was really drawn to um, the chapter, it was chapter two, and um, where you go through some forms of kind of cultural memory. Yeah. Um, one being um, the Norwegian um, kind of re-articulation of the Congo village. Yeah. Um, so kind of, was it 100 years after the original mm -hmm. Congo village, um, Norway um, restaged um, or reconstructed um, this village and, you know, with some surprises and, you know, kind of modern, um, you know, twists and turns. But so there's that. And then there's also this section in which you talk about um, the re uh, kind of like, yeah, like um, kind of restaging um, of these Congolese artifacts in right. Sweden. Traces of the and Congo. The traces of the Congo mm -hmm. exhibition. Exactly. Um, and, you know, and, and these, both of these, you know, kind of displays or exhibition, um, were not without, you know, um, controversy, um, and, you know, in public discussion and dialogue. And so I'm really curious about, um, you know, to what extent do you feel like, are you able to, particularly in the Swedish context, are you able to, um, you know, kind of resurrect colonial, you know, artifact, colonial visual imagery um, in a way that is critical, in a way that is, um, you know, engaged with 
um, kind of remembering the past, um, mm-hmm. but not necessarily recreating it. To what extent do you think that's possible and that's being done successfully in yeah. Sweden? Yeah, those are those are interesting moments. Uh, the Congo Village 2014 and an earlier uh, exhibition that actually toured Scandinavia, Traces of the Congo, Congo Spor, as it was called in, in Swedish, and I'm sure it's something very similar in Danish and Norwegian, um, in 2005, I think, 2005. Um, a few things about, about those, uh, those moments. Um, the first, and we're going sort of against chronology here, but the Congo village, um, was intentionally provocative. So in terms of remembering, actually what was being remembered there was, was a history of dismembering. <laughs> uh, it, it was, it was um, to, it, the, you know, the provocative aspect of this, that we're gonna create this, this human zoo and the, there was this, this sort of notion that maybe there will be Africans in it. Maybe they're gonna do it, that treat, you know, it's, it's exactly as, as it was in 1914. Um, and the, it, it didn't happen that way, it was an empty, Sort of staging of that of that of that village, and it turns out that the visitors were the <laughs> were the uh, the human um, captives, as it were. Uh, they they encountered themselves. Um, so this is an artistic provocation that is less about diasporic remembering than it is about histories of dismemberment uh, of of the kind that Wationgo is talking about, and that is not. That is interesting and productive in its own way. And in the book, you know, I make clear that it's not my. I'm not a. I'm not in a position to sort of judge it as an as a work of art as such, but um, it's it doesn't find a place in a history of diasporic remembering because the because um, this was not a place where, where where people of African descent in Norway were meant to encounter each other as as um, uh, as a community, right? Um, there was actually a threat of of a sort of um, dehumanization there that. I think was deeply troubling uh, and intentional. So the, on the other one, the traces of the Congo is also interestingly um, problematic for the ways in which it tried to stage a, a recollection of the colonial past in Scandinavia to put forward these artifacts as a way of grappling with that colonial history, acknowledging it. Um, but it became in part because of the absence of African interlocutors in the African diaspora in those places, a kind of memorialization of colonialism that that came very close to, to perhaps even romanticizing because it would it did because because it didn't have a uh, a firm critical grounding in an African presence <laughs> I think um, it it lacked it, it 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 lacked an ability to speak to I think the human um, consequences of that history um, so those are two interesting events which I will juxtapose now uh, with another. Uh, recollection of those artifacts that's happening. Uh, it might have just wrapped up, but it's it's been going on for a few years now. Afrika Polgor, Ongoing Africa in Stockholm, which has been curated by, uh, among other folks, uh, a friend and colleague, Michael Barrett, an Afro-Swedish anthropologist at the Ethnographic Museum. And some of those same artifacts on display, but contextualized in terms of Afro-Swedish history. So telling a story about um, about uh, Africans as people and their contact with Sweden with with Swedes in Africa in Sweden, inviting members of the African diaspora to think with these material objects, to think with not necessarily in terms of a of a kind of cultural intimacy vis-a-vis things that belong to them, but but as objects from Africa that speak to them as Africans, right? Uh, in some ways. Um, and so inviting folks to, cu- to come in and, and think through uh, this material culture and its history together in ways that, that vitalize and draw attention to, shed light on a diasporic presence. And, and that's, that's what sets that particular event apart from those other two, in my mind, uh, which are interesting and I think important, but um, don't speak to those forms of diasporic remembering as, as explicitly as this more current event that I think is... Um, is trying to do something different. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, we just had the midterms, so I'm just, you know, I'm thinking a lot about, as I'm sure many of us are, thinking a lot about electoral politics. And Sweden just had a big national election a couple months ago, and um, the Sweden Democrats, mm-hmm. who are, you know, kind of notoriously this far-right nationalist, um, you know, somewhat anti-immigrant 
group did pretty well. You said something like they won 20-ish percent. 20.5%, something yeah, like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they, you know, they did well. Um, and so I'm wondering what does this mean to have a kind of anti-immigrant group um, do so well in the national elections? What does this mean for the, you know, the, the Afro-Swedes that you're writing about, that you're encountering, that you're, um, you know, sharing, you know, sharing these kind of moments with in your book? Um, what does this mean for them that their country is being led um, in part, you know, um, or being kind of represented or being, um, you know, governed by um, people from this party? And like, what does that kind of mean for this generation? Um, and what do you feel like if you, you know, don't mind speculating a little bit, um, I know that can be dangerous, but what does that also, what do you feel like that might mean for, you know, what is this, you know, yeah, where, where, um, you know, where do you feel like this is headed and what does that mean? What are the kind of the implications for future Afro-Swedes? Yeah, uh, those are big questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in thinking about this question, um, the sort of elephant in the room, um, and that's a, you know, yeah, that, 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 that's, a, that's a phrase. I'm thinking specifically about uh, the way Michael McEachran, who's an Afro-Swedish philosopher and cultural historian, uses that phrase to speak specifically of whiteness in Swedish politics. The, 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 the elephant is in the room is a, a kind of normative whiteness, right, for, for Michael. Uh, and so I'm thinking with, with, with Michael here, uh, and in dialogue with, with, with that key word in my book, Renaissance, to acknowledge that at the same time that I am learning uh, and, 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 and bearing witness to what I think of as an Afro-Swedish Renaissance and beginning right around uh, in, in, in my book, 2012, but going, it going further back, but of a re- recent vintage, at the same time, you have, arguably, uh, a renaissance of far-right ethnic nationalism. Right? In 2010, the Sweden Democrats enter into the Swedish parliament, crossing the 4% threshold that a party needs to uh, have political representation. Uh, and that was that was a you know an earthquake that went off in in Swedish politics, um, uh, unprecedented um, shifts in 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 politics from the right and left are not unprecedented. But this was something new. And every election cycle subsequent, um, that party has has done better and better and better. And now uh, up to twenty plus percent uh, in the most recent elections, uh, September of this year. Um, they're not part of the government. But uh, they are the kingmakers, the puppet masters, whatever metaphor you want to use. The government is a small coalition constituting 30% of the, of the electorate, uh, electorate of uh, Swedish moderates, a conservative economic party, uh, liberals, a, a sort of uh, social libertarian party, um, um, and uh, the Christian Democrats. And together, they're, gov- they're governing with support of the Sweden Democrats. And the Sweden Democrats are essentially able to dictate the, the policy of this government. Uh, and that's what's new um, in terms of, in terms of the, this moment. Um, but what I want to draw attention to is the way in which you have this, 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 this rise in ethnic nationalism at the same time that you have these minoritized, racialized populations becoming more, more explicitly self-conscious of themselves in the public sphere. And I, what I see is... Um, is essentially two societal paths being proposed. You want you want to ask me to speculate, uh, two paths forward that are that are possible in this moment. And one and one path uh, recognition recognizes as a kind of um, as a kind of existential uh, founding principle that this society is diverse, that it includes a lot of different kinds of people, uh, and that is not always a comfortable diversity. Uh, it is always a complex diversity, but it is an, an essential diversity. Uh, and they're creating a language to speak about it. Um, I have Audre Lorde on the mind, and I, I wrote down a quote here because it rings so true to me. Poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. This is what these people are doing. They're using their language. They're using their art. They're using their... They're the tools, the human tools at their disposal to give name to uh, identities that had uh, previously not been part of the fabric of Swedish society, and they're calling them Swedish, Afro-Swedish, for example. So that's one path um, 
a pronounced, not always comfortable, always complex, artistically rich diversity. On the other hand, um, you have a path forward that to me suggests um, a certain kind of retrenchment predicated on cultural and ethnic nostalgia to a time when Sweden was far more homogenous and the, you know, between the line read is far more white. And that that's, that's what Sweden is, that's what it ought to be, and that's what it should remain. And while I can't predict the way those political visions might unfold and the kind of coalitional politics that might enable or disrupt them, right now we have a coalitional politics that seems to be amplifying the potential of the far right to govern. But I have good faith in that Swedish civil society to enable other visions uh, to not only persist, but make strong counter arguments. Um, the National Black Theater exists as an institution. They're gonna keep on per performing plays. Uh, the National Afro-Swedish Association uh, is an important organization of Afro-Swedes in civil society. They are going to continue to put on um, lectures and guided tours of Old Town Stockholm and the footsteps of the transatlantic slave trade. Activists are, are going to continue to be out on the streets and in public forums to speak out when they see and feel injustice. So they're not going to go away. Uh, and that is, that is uh, to me, indicative of possibilities um, that, are, that are yet to come. The, the good news is there, there, there's a foundation there for me, <laughs> I should say, um, uh, for, for what's yet to come, um, that those structures are firmly in place. So I, it's hard for me to see where this goes. It's an anxious moment. Um, there's a, there's an, an unprecedented shift in Swedish politics and people are recalibrating. So where, whatever that new balance is, that new equilibrium, uh, that will tell that next story, I think. Um, and people are nervous, people are anxious and afraid, um, people of color in Sweden, and that needs to be acknowledged too. But I do, I do believe that the work uh, will continue where that goes, as Stuart Hall say, would say, is anyone's guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like not a, an unfamiliar story, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I have many more questions, but we also only have about 10 more minutes left in the program, so mm. I wanted to see if anyone from the audience has any questions. Yeah. Just pause for a second. If not, then, okay. I'll just continue. Um, um, so I do, I just want to, yeah, I'm kind of curious. I mean, I hope folks read the book, obviously, but, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you if you have any, like, what are kind of the big takeaways, would you say, um, you know, if you can offer um, a couple of takeaways that you'd like folks to, um, yeah, to walk away with, both kind of substantively in terms of, you know, what you want people to know and understand about Afro-Swedes, and also kind of, you know, this is a work of theory as well, and yeah. so you really grapple with some big concepts like race and, you know, culture, diaspora, um, and so I'm also curious kind of theoretically if you have um, you know, a big takeaway that you'd like folks to, to walk away with. Yeah, it's, I do. I, you know, this is a work of the, at the intersection of multiple disciplines. Um, I'm an ethnomusicologist, but I'm also a card-carrying anthropologist. As a result of this book and my employment in, a, in an African-American and African studies department, I also work in black studies. And as a result of this book, I now identify um, as a Scandinavianist. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm a member of the you know, Society for the Advancement of Scandinavian Study now and the you know, uh, Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora because of this work. Um, and so I would like the work to, con to have, I would like the work to, to, to speak to these disciplines. Um, for Scandinavian studies, uh, and as this is something that I see the, you know, the American <laughs> Scandinavian Foundation doing to take seriously issues of uh, manifestly diverse societies in which race matters. Um, and, that, and that that work continue to, to uh, make productive interventions into uh, Scandinavian cultural life uh, in Europe and, and, and its diaspora, um, but also within the academy. On, on the black studies front, I think it's important to... Um, uh, bring the, the Afro-European story um, into uh, 
to bring those stories out more prominently within the discipline. I begin the book with an anecdote from Trevor Noah, right? A South African comedian in the United States, very famous, very funny, very progressive, but who makes a joke that essentially the butt of the joke is there are no black people in Sweden. And um, for more on the joke, read the book or, or watch YouTube. <laughs> um, and I love Trevor, Trevor Noah, um, but that reminded me of just how profoundly um, we are in this country, uh, in the United States, unaware of that, of that manifest diversity that I was speaking of earlier, and just the idea that there could even be blackness in this supremely white world <laughs> that is the Nordic countries. Um, you know, a supreme whiteness that goes back to the poetry of Langston Hughes. He invokes, you know, these words. This is a, this is a, a century-old notion. Um, that's the discourse that, that Trevor Noah is invoking of that whiteness uh, in, in, in Scandinavia. So I, I would like to bring that black presence in, in Europe, but also specifically in Sweden, more to the fore of the concerns of, of contemporary uh, black studies. And that's a matter of, I think, a certain degree of just simple consciousness. Now, within um, black studies and diaspora studies more generally, I do hope that these terms, remembering and renaissance, will, will signify something beyond the Swedish context. I think they're useful ways of thinking about, well, I think they're useful ways of thinking about community in general, um, and diasporas in, in particular, and the black and African diaspora, perhaps most specifically, precisely because of the Africanist lineages, the black lineages, lineages of those terms. So I hope those have a, have a carrying force and interest. Um, uh, so on those three levels, I think, you know, um, tackling the, the, these issues of, of race, um, as Monica Miller would say, in a place without race, um, uh, bringing uh, black life more uh, into the light of our consciousness about the African diaspora globally, um, and, and then th how, providing some tools that help us think more critically and constructively uh, and artfully, I think. I mean, Renaissance for me, and remember, there, it's about art, more artfully about, about diaspora. Um, it's in that kind of tradition that I that I want to be working and contributing to, mm -hmm. yeah. Which I feel like you've, I mean, successfully done. Yes, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, final question: What's next for you? I mean, this is. It sounds like you're working on a third book project. Um, yeah. Are you kind of? It sounds like you're a card carrying member of you know this you know Scandinavian uh, you know society. So I'm wondering mm. if if more of your projects are going to be leading you mm. in the direction of Scandinavia or more in kind of like Africana spaces like what's you know what are you working on what do you have brewing what would you like to work on in the future yeah so big questions for academics yeah so. and the good news yeah. is i have a project mm -hmm. <laughs> i can say something about that um i and it and it's a wonderful project and um he's a praise singer so i'm going to sing his praises he, he, praise singers don't often have their praises sung uh, he's a he's a griot this is donny cuyate is his name he's a griot um a traditional storyteller musician praise singer uh, from Burkina Faso in the Mande tradition. So this is, this is a, a cultural world that um, I have also studied. The Kora, this 21-string harp, emerges out of, that, out of that cultural space, that civilizational history. Um, and my first book is, is rooted in um, you know, a social world very much proximate to the one he grew up in, um, Mali being a neighbor to Burkina Faso. Uh, Dani lives in Uppsala in Sweden. Uh, Donnie is one of Francophone Africa's most well-known filmmakers, but he lives in, not I wouldn't say obscurity, but he's not very well-known uh, in, in Sweden. He's even produced an, a, a movie, a film, uh, in Sweden, the first film to prominently feature uh, an Afro-Swedish familial story in history. Um, it was released and, and received very little uh, uh, critical, critical review uh, and wasn't widely distributed within the Swedish theaters, uh, cinemas. Uh, and so he remained kind of in the wake of this, I think, path-breaking intervention in Swedish cinema, relatively unknown. And so the, the project is to uh, share his aesthetic worldview. So I'm thinking of it as a kind of biography and autobiography. It's, I, it's, it's, um, it's going to be co-written. The form it takes is still not entirely clear to me. But it is, um, I, want to, I want to share his words and art uh, with a broader public. Uh, I want Swedes to know about him. 
Uh, I want I want American. I'm an American English English readership, language readership to know about him. Uh, the films are spectacular. Um, they are documentaries. Uh, there's a serialized television program, uh, several feature films, many shorts of an extraordinary caliber. Uh, and he is uh, he is a griot. He's a master of the word. And so. Um, when we talk, we talk for hours, and um, I, I'm, I'm sort of in awe of his ability to formulate ideas, and so I want to share that. <laughs> That's the, so the project is, is still emerging. Uh, it is at the intersection of the work I, I've been doing in West Africa and the work I'm doing in Sweden. Um, his, his current, um, uh, he's working on um, a version of Macbeth right now in Burkina Faso. Uh, and uh, that's just going to be a, a lot of fun. Um, and so I, 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 if it comes through in my voice and my attitude here, I am enjoying this work. <laughs> uh, and I get to focus on a person. I've never really done that. I've written about societies, histories, communities, diasporas. Um, so the real challenge of this current work is to home in on a single person. Of course, the beauty of Donnie's work is that he's a person who wants to talk about diaspora community in the world. And so that's still going to be there. Um, but but in dialogue. So this is yeah. This is what I'm working on. Cool. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. We'll watch this space. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ryan, it's been a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Congratulations again on such a beautiful book. Teresa, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for being here. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs>